Henry Stanky hated flying. Actually, hate was perhaps the wrong word. Hatred implied anger, active resistance. Hatred was a type of control. Airplane flight filled Stanky with the kind of helpless despair he sometimes imagined must have poisoned the air of Belzin and Treblinka. He only felt anger when he looked around the boarding area at his complacent fellow passengers. Slumped in identical airport chairs like an exhibition of soft sculptures, their faces bored, uncaring, flattened into shadowlessness by the fluorescent lights. As he stared, he could feel moisture again between his hand and the chair's plastic arm. He ground his palm on the knees of his corduroys and was miserable. Why hadn't Diana come? Stanky hated himself for needing his wife this way, not for herself, but as a handholder, a nursemaid. When she had told him that her boss was out sick with strep throat, that they couldn't do without her at the office, and that he would have to go to Dallas by himself, he had wanted to reach out and shake her. She knew he couldn't cancel out this late. He'd already paid good money to ship his artwork to the hotel. He'd also used his scant funds to pay convention fees. He had to go. Diana knew how much he hated flying, dreaded it. Yet she had chosen to stay and help out her boss, Muriel, rather than him. The night she told him, he had not slept well. He had dreamed of cattle herded up a ramp, eye-rolling idiot cattle bumping against each other as they were prodded into a dark boxcar. The Thursday afternoon flight out of San Francisco was terrible. He almost took a couple of the Valium hidden deep in his pocket in a twist of saran wrap. Only the compelling thought that the plane might catch fire on the runway, that the panicking crew and passengers might leave him behind in drugged sleep, prevented him from taking the tranquilizers. Instead, as he always did, he clutched the lucky talisman hidden beneath his shirt. He was ashamed of it, really. A high bolo tie Diana had brought back from New Mexico, where her aged parents lived in a trailer camp, clutched it and wheeled the aircraft down the runway. Sweaty hand clasped on chest, he forced the plane up off the tarmac through sheer force of mind, dragging it aloft as the other passengers stared unconcernedly out the small windows, or read gaudy paperbacks, or slept. Slept. Once the jet was in the air, he began his terrified drill, smoothing the turbulence, wishing away dangerous crosswinds, tensing his legs so as to put the minimum amount of weight down on the cabin floor and avoid the laboring vibrations of the plane's underpowered, overtaxed engines. Fortunately, the passenger by the window, Henry always got an aisle seat, was one of those nerveless clods who dozed through flights and did not have his window blind open. Stanky was spared the additional stress of watching the plane's wings dipping and bucking crazily, straining to break free from the fuselage. No one who did not feel as he did about flying realized what a strenuous job it was. Three hours in the air, head flung back and eyes closed, white-knuckled hand wrapped around the hidden bolo charm, forcing his mind through an endless circle of airy, buoyant thoughts, helium, swans down, drifting dandelion puffs. At every bump or shudder, his heart began to speed even more swiftly. He had to redouble his efforts to smooth interference away, to guide the plane back once more to the path of least resistance. The landing was the worst part. As the captain's infuriatingly bland voice announced the beginning of descent and the plane nosed downward at a sickening angle, Henry Stanky pulled back on his seat arms until his wrists ached. The pitched whine of the engines mounted to a panicky scream, and he felt himself gradually lifting from the chair seat. Gravity in temporary abeyance, like that time, the one and only time, he had ridden the old roller coaster at Playland by the Sea. His heart climbed into his chest. His stomach pressed against the bottom of his lungs. But the man across from him was reading a newspaper, calmly extinguishing a cigarette. 
Henry closed his eyes again. The seemingly endless fall ended at last. There was a momentary sensation of leveling out. The wheels touched, lifted, then hit the ground once more with the full weight of the plane upon them. At once an even more terrible squalling started up as the pilot desperately tried to stop the hurtling plane before it skidded off the end of the runway into the terminal to explode in sun-hot flames. It didn't explode this time, but rather rolled down the Texas tarmac to a final stop. After getting into his hotel room and showering the sour odor of perspiration from his body, he slept for an hour, a dark, heavy sleep that nevertheless smoothed some of the cramping from his limbs and back. By the time he got to the conference room where the art show would be, ascertained that his paintings had indeed arrived and began to set them up in his assigned corner, a feeling of mild elation began to well inside him. He had made it by himself, without Diana, and now could look forward to tonight, Friday and Saturday, before he would need to begin thinking about the flight back. A tiny smile worked at the corners of his mouth as he tacked his paintings into their frames and fussed with the arrangement. It was good to feel good again. These conventions were important to him. Of course they must be. He went through hell to get to them. They were a priceless opportunity to have his artwork noticed, to touch base with people who could steer jobs his way and help him to break through. He had been just getting by for too long. That was the worst thing about freelancing, the never knowing, the waiting. Waiting for an offer on a cover bid, waiting for calls back, waiting to see if a project would hold together long enough to get him a guarantee. A kill fee. He was grateful for the lightening of spirit he was suddenly feeling. It was hard enough to make a living without scaring people away on top of it. It turned out to be a fairly good convention. Several people praised his work. He sold two small paintings, a large pen and ink, and a few smallish sketches. Roger Norisert of Lemuria Press dropped some large hints about an upcoming cover and illos possibility for a projected special printing of a Manly Wade Wellman book. Thursday and Friday passed quickly in a blurry montage of handshakes and name-tag squinting and several cheerfully tipsy conversations in the hotel lounge. Both nights he slept deeply. Dreamless interludes that did much to restore his normally affable outlook. Eating breakfast at a table splashed with Saturday morning sunlight, he remembered that there were indeed things he liked about conventions. That night, Stanky went with Norisert and a couple of writers to a Cajun restaurant downtown, where they sat up late, swapping stories and drinking beer. Henry got pretty tight and did not wake until late Sunday morning. It had not been a pleasant night. He had tossed and twitched, pulling the sheets loose from the mattress. Waking sometime after four in the morning from a dream of choking, he had found his lucky New Mexico string tie twisted tightly around his neck, bruising his throat. After worrying it loose with sleep clumsy fingers, he had pushed it into the pocket of his jacket, which hung on a chair beside his rumpled bed. Later, after dawdling around the hotel for a couple of bleak hours, watching the Cowboys and the New Orleans Saints play an endless game of exchanged turnovers, and after laboriously packing and labeling his flats, he found himself with nothing to do for an hour and a half until the shuttle bus, like Karen's ferry, would whisk him away to the airport, to the waiting airport. Some of the other passengers were talking about something he could not quite catch, the flight? But he would not be distracted. At last he reached the front of the line, put his ticket on the counter, and was told by the female mannequin in the royal blue vest that the plane was delayed. It would be an hour and twenty-five minutes late taking off. She might as well have hit him with a hammer. His defenses were keyed up. He was wound tight as a mountain climber's rope. And now this... He wanted to shout, to screech at this incomprehending woman with her twinkly rose parade smile. Turning hurriedly, he lurched to the high window where he leaned against a pillar and willed his heart to slow down. He would be calm. He would be calm. 
When he felt a little more in control, he went to the payphone to call Diana, to tell her he would be late. No one answered at home. It was hard not to feel betrayed. So he sat, staring out at the now darkening sky, trying not to watch the technicians scurrying like parasites beneath the bodies of the big jets. This was the last time he vowed to himself, never again. Other artists and writers got by without having to leave home. He could take the train if he really needed to go anywhere, even though it took days. It was ridiculous to scourge himself this way. Stanky, squinting suspiciously through the high boarding area windows, could see nothing overtly wrong, but that of course meant nothing. He would never see the loose bolts that would vibrate free and drop the engine like a stone. Never detect the fault in the landing gear that would snap the wheel off on contact and send the jet sliding to flaming oblivion. He boarded, a stale taste in his mouth, and found his way to seat 21, near the back of the plane. After stowing his shoulder bag, he sat down and promptly fastened his seatbelt, then reached his hand up to his breastbone to feel for the lucky bolo tie hanging beneath his shirt. It wasn't there. He checked the pockets of his jacket, which disgorged keys, wallet, ticket folder, receipts, and matchbooks, but no good luck talisman. In a growing panic, he unbuckled his lap belt and sprang up, nearly knocking over the crew-cutted businessman seating himself across the aisle. Stanky jerked open the overhead compartment and levered out his bag, opening it across his lap to rummage through the carefully folded shirts and socks. The Mexican woman in the seat before his shifted her wet-mouthed baby to look over her shoulder at him as he cursed to himself, emptying the bag with trembling hands. The bolo tie was nowhere inside. Henry could dimly remember taking it off in the night and putting it in the pocket of his jacket, but he was wearing that jacket now. He searched the pockets again, fruitlessly. As he sat in the wreckage of his meticulous packing, a pert-faced stewardess leaned over to ask if he needed any help. Unable to speak, he shook his head and began to stow the clothing back into the bag. Dislodging a stack of convention giveaway magazines, which slithered to the floor. He excoriated himself and his disability as he crouched on the cabin floor, picking them up. The final passengers had boarded, and the doors were being shut. The compact thump of the vacuum seal sounded like the coffin lid of the premature burial. He could see the stewardesses walking down the aisle, checking to make sure the compartment doors were closed. Trim, blue-skirted death angels. Hair shining in the cabin lights. Henry unbuckled his belt again and scrambled out into the aisle, moving quickly to the lavatory. In the narrow room, scarcely even a closet, he felt the surge of claustrophobia. Why had he come back here? His face in the small mirror looked pale, haunted. He turned back toward the door. It all felt like a terrible dream, a grinding nightmare which he could not shut off. He remembered the Valium in his pocket. Maybe I can take one of these, he thought. No, better yet, take two, take three or four, sleep through the whole damned flight. If it catches fire on takeoff, so what? I'll never know. But how would the plane stay aloft? He knew, somewhere in his fevered thinking, that planes traveled every day without him on board, lifted off, flew, and landed without Henry Stanky's straining intercession. It could fly while he slept just this once, couldn't it? Yes, planes did that, but he hadn't been on one that had. He had always worked like a dray horse to keep them aloft pulled them along through the turbulent winds that sought to batter them to the ground like badminton birds. Could he relinquish that control? He had to, otherwise he would never make it. He knew that as a certainty. The jet gathered speed down the runway, engines howling like late-night movie Indians bent on massacre. And Stanky's hand rose reflexively to his chest. There was, of course, no charmed bolo tie to grasp. He clutched his lapel instead, crushing the material into a wet, wrinkled knot. Straining, heaving, the plane forced its way upward. 
By some miracle, it broke from the ground's cruel pull and mounted up at a fierce angle to the waiting sky. Henry Stanky, tendons stretched like violin strings, waited for either the sickening lurch of lost altitude or the now desperately awaited onset of drowsiness. Drowsiness won. By the time the aircraft had leveled out six miles or so above the Earth's hidden surface, he could feel languor beginning to creep over him, as though a warm, woolly blanket was settling over his body. His muscles unknotted. His breathing slowed. The woman sitting by the window a seat away looked at him sharply, questioningly. Henry, growing groggier by the moment, was even able to muster a thin smile. The woman turned away. The drone of the airplane made him feel as though he rode the night in a great, glowing beehive. It seemed that he had to claw his way up from sleep. The tar baby grip of the Valium held him back. But a part of his mind knew that he was urgently needed. Even as he clambered up from unconsciousness, he could feel the plane lurching and rocking, the cabin rattling like a toy in a child's fist. He opened his eyes, fighting for wakefulness, and knew he had been right. All his fears were now confirmed. He should never have taken those pills, never have relinquished control. He moaned, straining to dislodge the tendrils of sleep. The faces of his fellow passengers told all. This time no one was reading unconcernedly or chatting with neighbors. Like Stanky, they gripped their seat arms and stared straight ahead as the plane bucked and swerved. Eyes stared darkly from pale faces. The Mexican woman clutched her sobbing baby. Henry could hear her voice moving in the urgent rhythmic cadences of prayer. A sudden lurch and the plane plummeted, a drop that seemed to last minutes like the free fall of an amusement park ride. One woman's voice rose in a brief muffled shriek. The plane bottomed out, climbed a moment, stabilized. There was none of the usual nervous laughter. The heaving and the battering side-to-side -side swaying continued. Above the tense muttering of the passengers, Stanky heard the voice of the captain on the intercom. Even as he spoke, the stewardesses hurried down the aisle to the back of the plane. Impact. Time is stopping. Henry feels himself standing at last, a man at last, on his feet. He is thrown forward his flight as inexorable but unhurried as the slide of a black ice glacier. Forward like a stop-motion film of a plant growing, unfolding. Hurtling forward, but barely moving. The passengers around him are a frozen flash photograph, eyes bulging. Suitcases hang in the air like corpuscles in the clear ichor of a god's arteries. The walls of the plane wrinkle contract around him, surge toward the nose. The seats fold forward like a row of dominoes, the passengers folding with them, slowly, slowly, like a child's pop-up book being carefully closed. Stanky, unfettered, is passing through them all now, flowing remorselessly forward, sliding through the dividing substance of passengers and objects like a bullet tumbling through a sandcastle. The airline says that the victim had slept through the whole flight until the last descent, when he began to shout and writhe in his sleep, in the depths of an unbreathable dream. Unwaking, he had struggled with the seat, with gravity, with the belt itself, until he snapped it loose, the heavy canvas torn by a near incomprehensible strength, and had stood shouting in the aisle, eyes shut. The attendant looks the body up and down and shakes his head. He slides it back inside on near-silent rollers. So the attendant wonders, why is the corpse smiling? He has come through, and Henry Stanky is no more. He is a mote of light passing through a radiant universe, speeding through unending brightness. And flying is a joy. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.